Uh, so welcome, and uh, I'll hand it off to Carrie Marshner to talk about uh, Hemlocks. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk, Mitchell. I appreciate the, uh, the chance, and thanks to everybody who's joining for, for being excited about serving for HWA this winter. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about hemlock trees and why they're important, and then HWA and how to survey for it. So let's talk about hemlock trees. Hemlocks are a common tree species in New York. Uh, they used to be the third most common, and then they were the fourth most common, and I, they're either the fourth or the fifth most common now. Um, this map shows where they are in New York, the darker the color the more hemlocks there are. And so you can see that the Southern Tier and the Catskills, and then especially the Adirondacks and Tug Hill Plateau are particularly abundant, um, rich in hemlocks with some of the, some of the forests around Lake George being up to 70% hemlock. They fill a unique niche in our forests. They often grow on steep slopes and in shady areas, they're actually uniquely adapted to photosynthesize even in very, very low light environments. And that's why they sometimes hang on to their lower branches lower down into the canopy than other tree species do. We don't have another conifer that likes that kind of environment. So these are a really important tree. We, they're so important, we call them a foundation species, which means they make the e ecosystem that other species depend on. They provide a lot of ecosystem services that are sometimes called the ever-feeding tree because as the winter progresses and snowpack gets deeper, their, their drooping branches get pulled farther down so that deer and other animals can reach still reach the foliage. Um, they help stabilize stream flows throughout the year because they're photosynthesizing and pulling water up out of the ground in the spring and fall when we have an overabundance of water in our region. And then in the summer when we're often in drought, they are not as active as the, the hardwoods around them. And they also help keep our streams cool, both through direct shade and by keeping snow underneath their canopies a little later into the spring than in the surrounding hardwood forests. This is what we don't want to see in our region. Um, this is Pisgah National Forest in the um, in the, in the southern southern Appalachians, and all, what you're seeing there is is all the gray trees are the hemlocks that have died as a result of hemlock bullied elgin, which is the pest we're here to talk about today. This is an invasive pest that arrived on our shores around the turn of the last century and really started getting into our forests in about the 1950s. Uh, this is what it looks like, these white, waxy, woolly looking bundles that are on the twig at the base of the needle of our hemlock trees, usually on the underside because they like that protection from rain. Right there, those guys. If you take away all of that wool and you stick an HWA, a hemlock woolly adelgid, underneath a very strong microscope, this is what you'll see. Um, this, this curly child straw looking thing hanging down, that's its mouth part that it sticks into a hemlock twig to suck starches out of the tree. And then these little tiny pores up here, that's where they make their wool. It's not the taking away of starch that damages our hemlocks, we don't think. It's the way that the hemlocks busily wall off each tiny wound where each one of those feeding mouth parts goes in. So one or two HWA isn't a big deal, but when you have an infestation like this, there's so much damage on that twig that the tree can't get its sap out to the end of the twig to make new hemlock needles because that's where hemlocks make their new needles every year. And then when the needles here die, the tree doesn't have new needles to make new food, and eventually the tree starves. That's why we think our hemlocks are dying from HWA, is the very high population levels 
and the way that they respond to this kind of damage. On the East Coast, hemlocks die somewhere between four and 20 years after infestation, generally. In the South, it's more like four. Up here, historically, it's been more like 20 because we have these cold winters. We had these cold winters that when we get down below about negative five Fahrenheit, we start to see some pretty good mortality of that hemlock woolly adelgid. We didn't have great mortality the last several years. Um, and unless we get a really good cold snap this year, we're not gonna see it this year either. So our trees are dying faster as we're not getting those cold snaps. This is where HWA is. Um, this is a 2022 map. Um, it hasn't changed a lot in large part because, you know, most of New York is already positive for HWA. So it started, HWA in New York started way down near the city, moved its way up through the Hudson Valley, and then came out to the Finger Lakes. And then as of, um, 2017, we had a very small infestation that was controlled. And then in 2021, we found the Lake George infestation, which has just been growing and growing and growing. And so you can see that the areas that are left are the Tug Hill and the rest of the Andromedics are still clear. There's a big empty hole right here in the Eastern Finger Lakes, Western Catskills, and then out here in Western New York, there's a lot of area where we haven't found HWA yet. This is what the life cycle of HWA looks like. They lay their eggs in the late spring, early summer for the overwintering generation. Those hatch and then hang out in a, like a suspended animation or hibernation, except it's not winter, so it's not called hibernation, uh, over the summer. And then in the fall, they wake up and start feeding and growing over the winter until in the mm, early April, or late March, early April, they start laying eggs for the spring generation. When those hatch, they don't have that uh, dormant period. They go straight through to adulthood and lay the second generation of eggs in the late spring, early summer, and then you're back here again. Um, this whole thing up here with the winged females, there is a third and a fourth and a fifth generation of HWA that all happen on a tree that we don't have in the eastern U.S. So the only ones that reproduce here are more wingless females that land on, um, on hemlocks. And that means that there's no sexual reproduction in the eastern United States. All of, all of our HWA are female, and they're all reproducing asexually, which means that any individual HWA that arrives in a new location can start a new infestation. Wintering spring. This is what the crawlers look like. They're very, very, very small. And as you can see, they don't have amazing legs. So they're not super mobile, but this is the only mobile stage of HWA. So they crawl around trying to find a new home to put in their mouth parts and settle down for their lives. Um, sometimes they crawl onto deer or onto bird's feet and get transported to a new stand. Or they can also, if they're so small, they can blow on wind to arrive on a new tree or in a new stand. And then once they settle, they start to feed and grow and produce this wool, which is what we can actually see when we look at a twig. And they do that probably to protect themselves from, from environmental dangers. And it's also the place where they lay their eggs. So this is what they look like from November to June. Each adult, if you pick away the wool, you can see the adult HWA. And then these are eggs. The adults lay between 50 to 100 eggs a piece, and there are two generations a year. So this is what it's looking like in April and May. So why do we have a problem? We have asexual reproduction, we have two generations a year, so two opportunities for exponential growth. And we have no native predators because this is an invasive species. All those things lead to no population control 
of HWA. So you get these huge infestations on our trees, and that's why we're seeing very, very high mortality from this pest. So what can you do? There's a short-term and a long-term way to manage HWA. In the short term, um, chemical treatment of your trees to protect them from HWA is the only available solution to keep our current our trees that are alive now alive into the future. In the long term, uh, biological control is probably the best solution. And treating our trees to keep them alive on the landscape prevents you think about the risks of adding adding these treatments into the landscape versus uh, not treating. It's not like there's the risks of treatment versus no change. It's the risk of treatment versus losing a foundation species in your forests. And that loss of the foundation species really causes a cascade of ecological changes as the forest transitions from hemlock forest hardwood forest, which supports a different range of species and doesn't provide the same services that the hemlocks do. The hemlocks are provide this deep shade all year round. It's warmer in the winter in the hemlock stands, provides refuge from cold winter um, environment. And then in the summer, it's up to 10 degrees cooler in the hemlock groves and a lot of a lot of animals go there to seek shelter. Um, they, the hemlocks host up to 300 different species of spiders. And um, there's just this whole ecosystem that's built around the hemlocks. We won't have if we don't work to conserve our hemlocks. So short-term solution is treating the trees to protect them from HWA. The long-term, the lab where I work Cornell University's New York State Hemlock Initiative. Um, we're working to develop a biological control solution for, for HWA. And benefits of biological control is that it's a long-term solution. Um, and once the populations are established, they take care of themselves. So you don't have to keep, keep managing it over and over and having these recurring costs involved with hemlock conservation. It's also something that is landscape scale, which is we just can't do that. We don't have the resources, any of us, to treat all of the hemlocks in New York. We have more hemlocks in New York than any other state in the Union. And so this pest is particularly important for us in New York State. We're still working on our biological control research. Um, we're hoping that this is going to be a viable long-term solution but biological control is not going to save trees that are infested now because it, the biological control won't be established soon enough to save those trees. And that's why that short-term solution is so important. So the best thing to do for our hemlocks is to get out on the landscape and figure out where HWA is so we can take care of it and keep those hemlocks healthy um, while we're figuring out a long-term solution for this pest. What's the best time to look for HWA? Um, you're looking here at the hemlock tree and that life cycle of HWA. Remember, it lays its eggs in. Uh, actually, the, the second generation lays eggs in June, and then the crawlers are out in July, and then it's estivating, which means it's doing its, its dormant during the summer. Hard to find in the summer when it's small. It looks like this, which you can see if you have a good search image for it. Um, but but it's just a lot harder than finding those big fat bully bundles on twigs. So you can survey in the summer. Um, it is possible. But it's um, it's easier to find in a well-established infestation because you'll see the old wool from, from previous generations. The HWA wake up in the fall, they start putting on wool, and just about mid-October, we're ready to say, get out and survey. But then, of course, it's hunting season, and it's not a great time to be wandering around in the woods. 
So generally our volunteers don't go out until after gun season for deer is over and Christmas is over and it's New Year's is over. So it's usually early January that people start spraying. And then um, January and February and March are good times to survey. And then by mid-April, we have those crawlers out. And that's the one time of the year that you can actually spread HWA yourself um, by accident, is if you're out there surveying or messing around in the hemlock woods and you get the crawlers on you and go from stand to stand because you're surveying and then you're maybe spreading those crawlers. I don't know how likely it is, but we try, don't encourage people to survey in invested areas from about mid-March or mid-April through mid-June. So that's because that's the, the period when HWA is actively moving around. So that leaves this window in the winter for, for prime survey season, and that's what we're talking to you today. How do you survey for HWA? Um, basically, you're just looking to see if it's there. And then um, ideally reporting how much you find, because that'll help us understand how long it's been established. And if you can report on how healthy the trees are, that's a really useful additional. Some survey tips. Get out there during that prime survey window. But tree health, if you're seeing a sickly stand, that might be a good place to look first. Um, in the winter, porcupines use hemlocks as a, as a significant food resource. And so they're climbing up into the hemlock trees, nibbling off the terminal twigs and then dropping them. And I think they're eating the phloem in the twigs, but I'm not sure. But the result is that there's a bunch of twigs on the ground from the top of the tree that you can't see in any other way. So look for those branches on the ground and see if there's HWA on them, because that's the only way to survey that top of the tree without getting out of line either. Survey the branches you can reach, or you can reach with a hook or a ski pole to reach up, pull it down. And that way you can get it in your hand and look. You can also, if you want to, invest in a very high powered um, headlamp. Usually about 2000 lumens is good, it's something that you can focus. If you get a really bright headlamp and you focus it and look up into the tree, you can see a little higher than you can just reach with your hands. Um, up to you if that's something you want to do. Looking up into the tree and guessing what you're seeing with the naked eye often results in false positives because you look up and you think you see little white things near the twigs, but it's actually light coming through um, at the base of the needle. The underside of the twig is where most of HWA is. Sometimes you'll see a few on the top, but mostly they're on the underside. So you grab the twig, flip it over, and look at the bottom. And it's a good idea to check branches on all sides of the tree. If you think about how tiny those little crawlers are, they're going to just settle when they find a good spot. And so um, distribution of HWA on a tree can be very patchy. And you can look at three sides of a tree and then you find it on the fourth side, even though you didn't see it anywhere else. So it's good to, to be pretty thorough, often because hemlocks grow on slopes. You can't reach all the, all the way around the tree. But, you know, do try to check as many sides of the tree as you can reach branches for. Which one is the hemlock in this? Um, this is a balsam fir. It's skinny. It's very upright. All of its branches are kind of pointing up. So that's not the hemlock. That's a red spruce. Um, it has much longer branches and a wider profile. But again, everything is going up. This one over here with the, del oops, the delicate branches that kind of droop over, that's the hemlock. Uh, my boss likes to call hemlocks the Labrador, Labrador puppies of the tree world. Um, overall tree health, a really sick tree that's had HWA for a long time is going to look like this. You, you see a lot of dead branches. That doesn't, um, hemlocks do self prune in a dense stand. So the dead branches by itself is not a giveaway, but these, these dead branches that have lots of fine twigs still attached. That's a recently dead branch. And then if you look up, you can see you're seeing a lot of daylight 
through that crown. That, that is a tree that is on its way out. The other thing is if you look down here on the trunk of this tree, you can see that the bark is red instead of um, grayish. That's because this tree has been infested with a secondary pest, hemlock borer, and the woodpeckers will come in and start flaking the bark off going after the hemlock borer beetle. Over here, this is a really hemlock. These are two or three really healthy hemlocks right here. Um, I, and then over here, this is what a tree that's had HWA for several years and has had taken a lot of damage looks like. You can see it's much grayer and look how much more daylight you can see through it than these healthier trees. And I was looking at this this morning and I think that this one's also infested. It's just a little bit thinner and a little bit grayer than these ones in the front. What does HWA look like? This is what a healthy hemlock twig looks like over here on the left. You can see these little white flecks down here. That's not HWA. That's just the, uh, it's called the peg. It's like the petiole, except it's a conifer. So it's not called a petiole of the leaf on um, there. So that's not HWA. This one doesn't have HWA. These two over here, right, these have HWA. It's this cottony, woolly looking stuff on the twigs at the base, isn't it? Uh, mostly on the undersides. Uh, another important thing for hemlock identification, you see these two white stripes on the bottom of the, of the twig? Um, that's, that's one of the indicators for HWA. Mitch, I see you telling me I have five minutes left. Yeah, just want to give the five minute warning and also to remind everyone um, if you have any questions about HWA and hemlocks, please put them in the chat box because we will have some time for questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Here are some, I'm going to run through a whole string of HWA lookalikes. Um, this long brown and yellow thing and this white over here, that's a long hemlock scale. You see that it's on the needle, not on the twig at the base of the needle. This is another invasive species. Please put this in IMAP and mark it as a long -head hemlock scale. And if you have a photo that has both HWA and a long -head hemlock scale, you can, is there an easy way for them to enter both of those, Mitch? Can you cover that in your section? Sure, yeah, I can talk about that. Thank you. Uh, this, Brown, these brown needles all curled up with white inside. That's not HWA, that is hemlock needle miner. So this is the little cocoon that this needle miner moth or butterfly, probably a moth, but the, <clears throat> the antenna look like butterfly to me. Um, right here, that's needle miner. Spider egg sacs, they're bigger than HWA. They don't look quite as woolly. They're more silky and they're usually not on the twig at the base of the needle, although you can see this one is right in that area. Not HWA. Spittlebug foam. Foamy, not woolly. Often on the twig, but much bigger than HWA and not that woolly bundle. Oak skeletonizer. Um, that, that is, this is a cocoon for this species that's, again, laid on the needle, not on the twig. That's HWA. It's on the twig, usually at the base of the needle, but not always. Um, this is what HWA looks like. This looks to me like a piece of last year's wool that fell off and landed on a on a needle. Don't be confused. Focus on the focus on the twig. Where should you look? Uh, the yellow is where HWA is. It, you can see it underneath the blue wall all the way up here in Lake George. It's also all along the lake shore here. Um, you can look anywhere you want for HWA. You can report within these areas where, that are already yellow because we don't always know that it's in a specific location. Report it anywhere you find it. But we would love if you would report in these blue areas, which is are places where we haven't found HWA yet and we're expecting to find it either sooner, sooner, sooner or later hopefully up in here is later 
So survey now, so we can find it, so we can treat it, which is the short-term solution for hemlock conservation. In the long term, we're hoping that biocontrol will be the long term solution for HWA. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I hope it has provided some useful pieces for you as you think about going out to survey for this pest. Thanks so much. Yeah, that was great. Um, I don't. Did I? Oh, yes. there are. I was. Yeah. There are questions in the chat, but I actually haven't figured out how to get there yet. Okay, I can read some of them for you. Thanks. Um, let's see. So you covered this a little bit, but how can uh, Kaylee asks, how can we make sure we don't bring any HWA with us to multiple sites? That is a great question. Remember, HWA, if you pull it off the twig, once it's settled, it cannot reinsert its mouth parts again. It's lost, it loses that capacity once it settles. And so you can't spread adult HWA from one place to another. Once you're in egg laying season, you could spread the eggs, possibly, um, but it's not something that we've ever seen happen. Um, but maybe just look at your gloves as you go from stand to stand and brush off any HWA wool. Be more cautious after about mid-March, which is when they start laying eggs. Um, and then if you're in infested stands, maybe don't go from an infested stand to an uninfested stand, handling the branches like survey you do during survey after about mid April, when they, when those eggs start hatching and we start to have callers out on the landscape and we will put out a notification on our social media, um, in when, whenever we start to see. We'll, we'll let people know when we see if the first egg's laid, and then we'll tell people um, more seriously, maybe you should dial back on your on your survey in places where some places are infested and some aren't once we see crawlers. And that's why this challenge ends when it does, so that we're not encouraging people to survey into the reproductive stage. Great, thank you. Another question. Uh, from Stacy, will the adults always be found at the growing tips? No, um, the adults do prefer. So the the overwintering generation, um, they emerge after that elongation of the hemlock, the new growth in early June, late May, early June. So they love to settle on the new foliage, but they don't always. They settle where they land. And then that spring generation doesn't have the new foliage available, so they'll settle wherever. All right. Um, and the last question, is there a natural predator of HWA from its native range that could be used to control it? That is a wonderful question. That's what we spend most of our time at the Hemlock Initiative thinking about. Um, there have been surveys done to Japan, uh, where, where our particular strain of HWA came from, and to China. Um, and people have looked at potential biological controls from those areas. And, and we have worked with uh, Laracobius osakensis from Japan. But we do almost all of our work with West Coast um, biological controls of HWA because the West Hope Coast has two different species of hemlock that have ha been infested with HWA for several hundred thousand years. And um, and so they've got a whole ecosystem of predators that help manage that pest on the West Coast. And we're working with three of those, uh, Laracobius nigrinus, which is a beetle that feeds on the winter generation of HWA, and then two species of silverfly that feed on the spring generation of HWA. And those are our main, main species of interest for biological control. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, so that's all the questions I can see. Uh, make sure you follow Hemlock Initiative um, <laughs> so you can get those updates like Carrie mentioned. And that website, the New York State Hemlock Initiative.info, has all the information you, you might want on biological control and on HWA management. We have some tools for help if you have a large property and you're trying to figure out which stands you can treat with the money that you have. We have tools to help you with that. Um, and, and you can 
reach out to us and ask questions if you want. Great. Thank you so much for talking to us all about this. Um, it's been great to have you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Mitch. Have yeah. a great afternoon. Thank you. And so with the second half of the webinar today, we'll turn it over to um, participating in the challenge, uh, being a volunteer and using IMAP Invasives. So uh, to get started, so how to participate in this mapping challenge. Um, and I assume I'll put it up at some point, but the mapping challenge runs from February 1st through March 15th. Um, so basically the prep work is just to get set up with IMAP invasives and to learn how to identify hemlocks in HWA. So hopefully you've got a good handle on that, that second piece already from Carrie's presentation. Um, and yeah, so that says from now, but actually it's starting February 1st, which is tomorrow. <laughs> um, so you have to find hemlocks, check for HWA, and then report to IMAP. And one thing to note is that we take presence and not detected. So if you're surveying somewhere and you're checking the hemlocks and you don't find any hemlock lily adelgid, that's still really useful information. So you just put some effort into checking whether there's HWA and you didn't find it. So that's that's telling us that it's probably not there yet or maybe it's not there yet. So um, reporting those not detecteds are really useful for us and they also count towards the challenge. And so basically this, this uh, challenge is set up so that the person who surveys the most sites based on IMAP data will win a prize from the Hemlock Initiative. And that prize will be a, um, a hat with the Hemlock Initiative logo and the uh, bragging rights, I guess. <laughs> and so uh, one thing is we do like to uh, reward new volunteers. So um, we do kind of give preference to new volunteers. If there's a couple people who are kind of high up in the lead, we tend to give it to a newer volunteer rather than, you know, the person who won the previous year. Um, so that's just one thing to be aware of. Um, and also we give some preference to people doing surveys in what we call the survey gap counties. So, um, Carrie kind of showed this too, uh, a little bit differently, but so there's, there's New York state, um, there are different levels of hemlocks in different parts of the state and, um, some parts of the state have HWA currently and some parts do not have any reports yet. So. In these areas where um, kind of near the edge of the infestation, where we maybe don't have that many reports, but we do know that it is kind of in the area or nearby. So places like uh, Western New York, um, this sort of Cortland, Chittenango, uh, Oneonta kind of area, um, this, uh, the Eastern Lake Ontario region, and the Southern Adirondacks. So those are all areas where we really, we, we appreciate surveys in those areas um, the most. So we, like Carrie mentioned, we appreciate data anywhere, but these areas are kind of the key areas where we really want people to go look. So when you survey areas within these counties that we've selected kind of based on that map, um, those sites count double. Um, towards your, your totals for uh, the competition. And you can find that map um, at our website. And so another thing we always like to talk about is how many points to be submitting. Um, so for instance, if you get to a stand and there's dozens of trees and they all have HWA, do you need to drop a point for every single tree? Um, so this is what we recommend. Um, so in a case where there is no hemlock adelgid, generally um, just one or two points is enough. So for example, you could do drop one point at when you start your hike, like at the trailhead, and then as you go in, drop your second point as far as you go in. Um, and if there are any particularly large stands in the middle, you could note those with other not detected records. Um, but in general, 
just a couple, even if you're, you're walking a long trail. Um, and for areas where there is hemlock oleodelgid, in general, uh, so if it's an infected, infested stand, so there's dozens of trees and they all have HWA, we really just need one point for that. Um, in some cases, particularly in a survey gap region, um, you might come to a location where most stands and most trees do not have hemlock oleodelgid, but maybe a couple of them do. And so that's a case where it might actually be valuable to uh, put points for those individual trees um, if there's only a handful. And I know those weren't really hard guidelines, so we really do, we just expect people to kind of uh, use your judgment, do the best you can, um, but there is no like hard and fast rules. Um, overall, we just want you to um, to be out there looking for hemlock adelgid and then reporting your efforts um, without getting bogged down in entering, you know, hundreds of points. Um, so just, just a couple points to represent your survey efforts. And just a reminder that we determine the winner by kind of the number of sites they survey um, rather than the raw number of points. And some, some other words of advice. Um, so stay within your comfort zone. Um, so as much as we do want data on hemlocks pretty much anywhere, um, we don't expect anyone to be, you know, scrambling up cliffs or going into areas they wouldn't otherwise. So stay within your comfort zone, the trails you know, or kind of the areas you know, um, staying on trail, that sort of stuff. Um, pay attention to the weather and sunrise and sunset. So if there's a blizzard, the your your HWA survey can probably wait, um, and that's going to be fine. Just wait for a better a better weather day, and make sure you you plan to be be surveying during daylight hours. Um, make sure you're following and aware of any rules and regulations on the places where you are surveying hemlocks. And yeah, choose trails widely, wisely, so within your comfort level. Um, there is also this concept of the 10 essentials for winter hiking. Um, so you can, you, probably the easiest way is to just Google that, Google Green Mountain Club 10 essentials. Um, so things like hydration, light, uh, that sort of stuff, warmth, things, things that you need for winter hiking. Um, paper maps are always good too. And so that's the basics of participating in the challenge. So next I was gonna highlight some volunteer opportunities across the state. So this map is the PRISM map. So PRISMs are partnerships for regional invasive species management. So New York State is divided into these eight regions um, where an organization, uh, usually two to five staff is um, kind of uh, managing partnerships in the region for invasive species work. So running education and outreach, running survey programs, working a lot with local partners. Um, so each of these prisms um, are, many of them are often looking for volunteers and some of them have their own uh, volunteer efforts going on right now that are focused on hemlock adelgid. So some examples, um, the Finger Lakes has a Finger Lakes HWA survey. Um, and so we have links to all of these on our website. If you go to nyimapinvasives.org slash HWA. So I encourage you to go there if any of these groups are relevant to you. So like if you're in the Finger Lakes region, which is on this map here, and you're interested in serving for HWA, I encourage you to connect with the Finger Lakes HWA survey. Um, similarly, the Western New York PRISM has a program called the Western New York HWA Hunters. So any of you in Western New York who want to survey for uh, Hemoply Adelgid, please connect with that effort. And um, in, in Northern New York, so SLILO has a volunteer surveillance network and they also have a virtual hike challenge. So I encourage you to look into that as well. And um, the Adirondacks has an effort too. Um, and in other parts of the state, um, they also, they, they might not have a specific HWA related prog program going on right now, but in general, um, they are 
often welcoming uh, people to come and connect with their PRISM, uh, go to their website, learn more about what they do, um, and they oftentimes have volunteer programs throughout the year. And um, at the, there are also some uh, statewide programs that you could join. Um, so the Hemlock Initiative has a couple community science programs. So one's called My Hemlock. There's another one called HWA Hunters. Um, so you can go to the Hemlock Initiative's website to um, learn more about those volunteer programs. Okay, and the, the last thing for today is how to actually use IMAP invasives. And I'm just checking the, the chat to check for any questions. Um, so please feel free to enter any questions that come up um, in there. Um, so I'll give a brief run through of how to use IMAP invasives and how to report your hemlock surveys. So to, to first thing you have to do is create an account or log into your account if you already have one. So go to our website at nyimapinvasives.org and click the login button at the top right. And that brings you to our sign-in page, which is also where you create an account. So if you have an account, you can just log in at the top. Um, if you don't remember your password, you can reset that. Um, and if you're having any uh, problems, um, you can always email us. And if you don't have an account yet, then you just create one. Um, it's free, um, it's, it's usually pretty quick. So basically you just put your information in the sign up box, um, select New York for your jurisdiction, cause that's where you'll be collecting data and then hit the join button. And the only thing to take note of there is that clicking join that creates your account, but um, it doesn't activate it. There's one more step you have to take. So basically you just have to Go into your email, whatever email address you put in um, the sign up form um, and read the user agreement and activate your account, basically just to verify um, your email address. And again, if you have any issues, contact us. And I do see um, the that question in the chat from Jim. So are the different groups linked? Um, so Jim, for example, is in the Adirondack group. And so in they are all linked in the sense that we're kind of all working together to build our understanding of the distribution of hemlock related delgid and we're using IMAP invasives as the centralized database to store all that data. Um, so a lot of the people coordinating the different volunteer programs are um, very much connected to each other, um, but they're kind of separated into these different programs more in how they're administered. So. For instance, the APIP staff kind of run the volunteer program in the Adirondacks, and then in Western New York, it's run by the Western New York PRISM staff. Um, so it's just kind of, uh, it's kind of broken up into these different pieces so that uh, people can run in-person trainings in their region and stuff like that, uh, because New York State as a whole is a very wide re region, and it's very, it's very hard to like have one program uh, be run throughout the entire state. So it's kind of sectioned off into these smaller groups. Um, so once you have, uh, once you've created an account, um, when you sign in, it should look like this. Um, there isn't much you have to do in the online version. Um, I'll mostly talk about how to uh, report using the mobile app, but if you're interested in the online version, um, there's a lot of stuff in here where you, that will help you kind of learn about invasives in your area. So you can look at the map um, and filter on different species you're interested in. Um, so just to give you a brief tour of the online tool. So there's the main menu at the top. There's navigation tools to zoom in and out of the map. Um, and there's action tools at the top. For example, the filter tool. Say you wanna just look at uh, a distribution map for Hemlock Lily Delgid, for example. And then there's um, map layers on the right hand side. And so, um, let's see. So, the way that IMAP data collection kind of works so there's the online interface 
um, where you can kind of view the data and you can also enter data there. And then there's also our mobile tools. So for example, the, the mobile app um, where you can um, create records for, for presence or not detected. And the big benefit of the mobile app is that you don't need to be connected to the internet. So for, excuse me, the website, you of course have to be connected to the winter, the internet. Um, usually you'd be on your computer. Um, so if you're out on the trail, um, maybe outside of connectivity, kind of um, out in a remote area, the the website's not really going to work, so you're going to want to use the mobile app. Um, but all of these tools kind of feed into the same IMAP platform. Um, so they're just kind of all part of the same system. So now I'll talk a little bit more specifically about the mobile app. And I encourage anyone interested to follow along. So basically the, the mobile app, you can find it in the app store. So whether you're on an Apple device or um, on an Android device, um, just search IMAP Invasives and this is what it's gonna look like in the store. Um, it's the author will come up as SUNY ESF. Um, so that's our host organization. And one thing I'll note, um, so while anyone's downloading that app before I go through the quick run through, um, I just wanna make a plug for the importance of good photos. So on the left, those are HWA photos, but it's a little bit challenging to tell that at first because the way that the focus is. So in, in the top one, it's kind of blurry and it's the stuff in the background that's coming up clear. So it's kind of hard to tell uh, with, a lot of certainty whether this is um, whether this is indeed hemoglobin adelgid. So I really encourage people to try to focus their camera when they take pictures. Um, so in this example, you can really tell very clearly that this is hemoglobin adelgid because it's a very clear photo. Um, you can see the hands behind the photo, which helped the camera focus and gave some scale. Um, so good photos are really important, but we do understand you kind of just have to do the best you can. Like sometimes the lighting's not good, uh, it's windy. Um, so we understand that not all photos are going to be perfect. We just encourage you to do the best you can. So there's kind of a three-step workflow through the app for the app. You have to set up the, the app and get your account connected. Um, and you do that while you have internet connection. But then you're all set to go out into the field and record your observations, even if you don't have any service. And then when you get back home, you have to upload those records to the online IMAP database. So setting up your account, when you download the app um, and open it for the first time, it'll come up to this sort of screen. And so basically you just have to put input your information and press this green retrieve IMAP list button. So, for example, we would all put New York State here. You'd put in your username and password, um, the same that you used for creating your account. And I'll just remind people that you do have your account has to be active for this to work. So, once you created your account, you have to go into your email to to verify your email address and activate the account. And um, if anyone is it already has the app and you're you're opening it for the second or third time it won't bring you straight to that preferences screen but you can always get back there so it'll it'll bring you to that blank green screen and to get back to your preferences you just tap the main menu on the left and select preferences um so once you've entered your information you press that retrieve imap list button and hopefully you'll get this green success message if you're not getting that message um Sometimes trying again helps, so, so try retyping your password, make sure you get everything um, correct, and try it again. And if you continue to have problems, please reach out to us. And um, that's kind of the most important thing for setup. Um, you can just finish right there and go out and start collecting observations, but there are some optional settings that you might be interested in. So, for instance, uh, you can create, you can pick which list uh, what name you want to see species as um, in the species list. Um, you can create a short list of species. Um, so you'll see how this will help later on. So when you select, when you're creating an observation and you select the species, you select from this very long list of species. 
um, if you customize your list to maybe five species, including hemlocally adelgid, um, it'll just be a faster process later on. Um, but everything else you can really uh, leave as defaults. And always remember to save your, uh, anytime you make changes to your preferences, press save at the bottom left. So that's the setup piece. The, the next step is um, you can go out and record observations out in the field. Um, I do recommend that you do a test record first. So we have something called fake species uh, set up in IMAP where you can enter a test record for a fake species just to see how it all works before you go out into the field. So I'll run through how that looks quickly. So to add an observation, you click the add observation button at the top right. And you'll be brought to this screen and the first thing you're prompted to do is get a photo. And so, as I mentioned, those photos are really important. So you can either take a photo by tapping that take photo using camera, or if you already have the photo, you can select that from your photo library. And just to let you know, um, you might want to test this out beforehand, but it is possible to take, bring in a photo that you've taken, um, say, yesterday or a few weeks ago uh, and pull it in from the select photo from library button and it will actually pull the date and location from that photo like from the metadata that's stored on your phone um, so that is an option too um, if you have a custom list you'd want to enable that and then you have to select the species so right now i'm suggesting that you select a fake species uh, when you're out in the field, you'll probably be selecting hemlock lily adelgid or the elongate hemlock scale that Carrie mentioned. And you have to select detected or not detected. And so those are the most important things, really. Getting the photo, picking the species, and detected or not detected. Because you'll see that the date is captured automatically and the location is also captured automatically. Um, and you can see that on the map here. So one thing to be aware of is if you are in a remote area, the map imagery might not be loading. So this point might be in the middle of a blank gray map. That doesn't necessarily mean that your location isn't working. It just means that your base map isn't loading because you don't have internet. Um, so the thing to check is just if you have this long latitude longitude um, in the location field, then your location is probably working just fine. The issue would be if it says zero, zero. So that probably means that um, you need to enable some location services or something. Um, and that kind of varies device to device. So let me know if any of you uh, have that issue. And then um, under the map, there's some optional fields. So some volunteer programs use projects. Um, so if any of you join one of those volunteer programs, you might they might tell you about this. Um, but in general, projects are completely optional and you don't need to, to figure out what project to report to or anything. You can just leave that blank. And same goes for organization. That's usually used for people doing surveys as a part of their job. Say they work for a PRISM or um, the Hemlock Initiative. Uh, for, for most volunteers, you don't need to select an organization. Um, one thing that is sometimes valuable is entering the approximate time you spent searching. So if you went to a hemlock stand and you spent 20 minutes going around different trees and checking branches, um, putting in that number of minutes that you your surveyed is really helpful to kind of give an idea for um, how much effort was put into that survey. And if you have any other miscellaneous comments, um, you can feel free to enter those in the observation comments. But you can also leave that blank if you're just kind of doing quick quick records. And remember to save your changes when you finish. So that's what it looks like to record an observation. And that saves it on your phone. But a very important last step is to then bring that into the online database where PRISM staff and the Hemlock Initiative and others can see that data. So when you finish creating a record and you press save, it'll show up as a yellow card on your home screen. And so that just means that it's stored on your phone um, 
and yeah, it's ready to, to go into IMAP whenever you're ready to upload it. So you'll see a pencil icon. That's if you need to make any updates. So maybe you notice that you picked the wrong species or you accidentally selected not detected instead of detected. So you can click the pencil icon to make those edits. Um, and there's also this checkbox. So if you're ready to upload it, what you do is you press the check box to check that off. And then you go into the menu and select upload selected. And it will will briefly ask you if you're sure you want to upload. And in most cases, you probably are. Um, so you just hit OK. And you should get a, a green success message. And then your screen should be blank. So the yellow card is gone. So it looks like the record just disappeared. But really what that means is it went into the online database. So it no longer has to be saved on your phone. Um, so it just clears out on your phone. Um, and one thing I'll also mention is that there is this select all button in the menu. So if you went out and you, you recorded 10 observations, you don't have to check each one off individually. You can just choose select all and then upload selected. And I just want to reiterate that it's really important to get these records into the database. So if it's saved on your phone, um, only you can see that it's not going to be seen by the conservation professionals across the state. So we really encourage you to make sure to get those into the database. And some additional things I just want to make sure people are aware of. Um, so, so what I've talked about so far, that's all you need to know to participate in the challenge. Um, but I just want to make you aware of some other things if you're interested. So, for example, you there's options to set up email alerts if you're interested in a certain area or a certain species, you can set up email alerts so that you see when new records come into IMAP for those species and areas. You can use the online database to view distributions for invasive species. So for example, you can look at a map of Hemlocklea adelgid. I do wanna mention that there are advanced data collection options. For example, there's a survey one, two, three form built for doing more advanced surveys on forest pests like Hemlocklea adelgid. Excuse me. Um, so in general, the, the mobile app that I showed you before is going to be the best tool for um, doing this sort of volunteer mapping program with us, like the HWA mapping challenge. Um, but if you find yourself wanting to do some more advanced surveys where you collect data on hemlock stands and that sort of stuff, we do have other uh, data collection options available that you can explore at our website. And so Carrie mentioned reporting both hemlock willy delgid and elongate hemlock scale if they're both on the tree. Um, so if you use our basic mobile app, which I just showed, you would just have to submit two separate observations. So select HWA in the first one and then the elongate scale in the second one. Um, if you use one of our more advanced tools, there are options to submit one record, but submit uh, select multiple present species. Um, so that is an option. Uh, but again, the mobile app is probably going to fit the bill for, for most of you. Um, and if any of you are part of a, an organization doing invasive species surveys, you can join that organization in IMAP. Um, so feel free to reach out about that if you want to learn more. Um, so I encourage you all to stay connected with IMAP Invasives. We do a monthly webinar the last Wednesday of the month at 1 p.m. And other trainings occur across the state as well. And we do offer self-guided training resources on our website. So with that, I want to uh, thank everyone for joining. Um, and you can look at the slide for our information. And um, oh, it looks like I went a little bit over time, so sorry about that. But for anyone who's able to stay on, please let me know if you have any questions. And I do see some questions from Michael. Um, I will save those for now. but. Michael, I can try to help you fix your account issue. Um, so I, but I'll, I'll save that for a minute. And so Stacy asks if this presentation can be shared and Kaylee asks if we'll get a link. 
And yes, this can absolutely be shared. I will be sending a, a link to the recording. Um, you might remember that I did forget to press record at the right beginning, so it might kind of cut in awkwardly at the beginning, but it still should uh, have all the information you need. Um, so with that, I think I'll, uh, I'll again thank everyone for joining and I'll stop this recording.